Hello everyone and greetings from rural Cambridgeshire in England. Why malign mechanicals? I use that term because we seem to have become swamped by an irrational faith in theoretical physics and mathematics. Mathematics is a marvellous tool for playing with the human-made concept of figures. And theoretical physics could not be surpassed when it comes to investigating ways in which materials behave and how they might be potentiated and perhaps improved or harnessed, almost in a medieval sense, for the exploitation of humankind. And why the denial of the sentient cell? Well, why is the cell denied? When did you last see a living cell? This is the most fundamental concept of importance in understanding ourselves and all the other forms of life that coexist with us on this strange blue planet. And yet, you very rarely see a living cell. You'll hardly ever find them on television. It is the cell that gives us our character, our personality. It is the cell from where our intelligence derives. And yet we seem besotted with physics and with maths. I mean, you've got mathematics on programmes in England, like Countdown, where people show how clever they are with figures. You have series like the Big Bang Theory from the United States, where we celebrate post-grads who are studying theoretical physics. And yet none of that is going to solve our everyday understanding of what we are, how we live, how we behave, our love, our fear, our likes, our dislikes, our health, our disease, our death. For at least half a millennium, we've toyed with the idea of analogizing humans to mechanics. We know, of course, of René Descartes, the French philosopher, and his insistence that animals were just there to be exploited by humans. They couldn't have any sense, they couldn't feel any pain. Views we would now regard as archaic and, and misplaced. But there are other authors whose works we ought to consider. What about Thomas Hobbes? In 1651 he published Leviathan, containing these words, For what is the heart but a spring? And the nerves but so many strings? And the joints but so many wheels? giving motion to the whole body. Man as Machine was the theme of a book published by the physician and materialist philosopher Julien Alfred de la Maitre in 1747. Then of course it was Arnold Bennett's book, first published in 1908. He said how a man will clean his car assiduously but can often neglect himself. Currently we have this book by Roche Brochard and Megan O'Giglin, who is a transhumanist. A word coined, incidentally, in 1814 by Henry Carey's translation of Dante's Divine Comedy. Then we have George Bridgman, an artist who taught Norman Rothwell. His book came out in 1939 on how the body is best conceived as a machine, and so on, how machines challenge humans. There's a lot of this. People love to say how computers can do things that no human can achieve. Well, so can a pair of scissors, so can a stapler, so can a paper punch. It is no philosophical argument. Of course, we have popular books like this Dawling Kindersley production and books for children. This one written by Laurie Frobe of New York. This strangely pernicious philosophy had invaded every aspect of our thinking from our very earliest years. Indeed, we tend to conceive of ourselves as being almost inherently inferior to the machinations of machinery. Images of the human body, along with its presumed equivalent of a machine, have dominated in popular literature. And it's not only in the Western world. This example was directly plagiarised by the Chinese. In the modern world, the notion that there are machines inside us continues to predominate. And even Leonardo's conception of the human body has been transmuted conveniently into machinery. In Germany, Fritz Kahn in 1927 produced this wonderful poster of man as an industrial palace. More recently, Henning Lederer has animated it in this extremely clever piece of computer graphics. But you see the problem. What is running this human body is machinery created by little men, created by humans, 
created by an outside agency. It is the essential self-regulated autonomy of the living cell that seems to escape everybody. You will not be surprised to learn that when I wrote my popular book on the human body, I made the opposite point. The book appeared in a host of overseas editions, and for me the important point was that the human body is most certainly not a machine. If a machine works harder, parts will fail. If the human body works harder, its muscles may grow bigger. If you drive a car for miles, its tyres wear out. If the human body runs for miles, the soles of the feet grow thicker. The human body is not a machine. So if the body is not a machine, what is it? It is, of course, a self-referential, self-recreating, autonomous community of semi-independent living entities with minds of their own. It is not imbued with the mechanical propensities with which we vulgarise it. And yet, you never see a living cell. Scholars rarely study them. Academics don't see them. The public never sees one. This is the most important concept that underpins our lives. With my dear colleague and friend, Dr Picketeeps, I've made a number of studies of what goes on within living cells, the tiny intricacies which you will never otherwise see. I want to see a world where the living cell is paramount, where it is a headline of our education, where everybody is familiar with what goes on down the microscope. It's the light microscope, not necessarily at high magnification. It's the light microscope that shows us and reveals to us the majesty of what goes on. And that's what should become daily currency. It should not anymore be a mystery. As it is, the way we consider ourselves, the way we review where we came from, is all imbued with this mechanistic nonsense. It is so backward-looking, so self-defeating, so pointless, so totally out of date. Our dialectical on human evolution has been hoodwinked by those who naively build a future on the constructs of the past. Ten million years ago, hominids were anticipated by apes, reminiscent of today's chimpanzees. By five million years, we saw Sahelanthropus chadensis, and then Australopithecus, which thrived some three million years ago, and may possibly be the ancestor of our genus Homo. The first species of which, Homo habilis, appeared two million years back in time. Homo sapiens first appeared in Africa some quarter of a million years ago. So, how do today's philosophers view the future? very likely as a superhuman automaton, the absurd notion of a singularity when people and machines combine to generate a greater whole is a concept of increasing popularity. The curious concept that life can be synthesised by physics and engineering is not as novel as you might suppose. In 1928, an engineering exhibition in London was due to be opened by the Duke of York, but he cancelled so a veteran of the First World War, Captain William Richards, and an aircraft engineer friend, Alan Reffel, decided to create a man made of tin to take the place of the Duke. Eric was the world's first robot to respond to audio signals who could rise and stand, point and speak. He gave a four-minute welcoming address to the thousands in attendance. In 1932, he was followed by Alpha the Robot, built by Harry May in London, who toured the United States and featured in Macy's, New York. Meet Alpha the Robot, constructed entirely of metal, but controlled only by the voice. How tall are you? Six feet. Six feet. By 1938, he'd been followed by Electro, constructed by the Westinghouse Electric Corporation in Ohio. Will you tell your story, please? I'll be very glad to tell my story. Often people say that cells are like bricks in a building, but they are so much more than that. Each cell is itself a semi-autonomous living organism with its own sense responses and decision-making. Bricks are built by people, cells by themselves. It is this lack of remote mediation that distinguishes life from machinery. 
To elucidate what I mean, let's turn to my collection of microscope slides, which I've prepared over the last 60 years. Here's a section of a full-term rat embryo, made when I was 20, stained with haematoxidin and eosin, and mounted in DPX. Down on the left, like a diminutive walnut, is the cerebellum, the part of the hindbrain in which are controlled functions such as voluntary movement and aspects of language and emotion. Under the low power lens, magnifying around 50 times, we can glimpse its cellular complexity. The medium power lens, at about 200 times magnification, shows us the way it's becoming organised. Moving to high power, about a thousand times, we can at last see the cells who know what to do as they regulate our everyday activities. Within each cell is a darker stained nucleus. To aid comprehension of what's going on, let's pick out a single cell on the left. First its nucleus, now the whole cell. And here's a second cell I've picked out. Here's a third and a fourth. If we pick out the cells in sequence, you can see how they comprise the cerebellum. And it is this compact cell community that knows how to regulate the way that we behave. We can peer into the cerebral hemispheres. This is where thought and memory and our mind is concentrated. There are a myriad complex cells here, a hundred billion in the adult human brain. If we stain them with silver salts, we can bring up the dendrites that bring in messages from one cell to the next. I've elsewhere shown that we can eavesdrop onto what the brain cells are saying to each other. It is simplistically claimed that thought is generated at the synapses where the neurons meet but never quite touch. My view is that thought is carried on within each neuron, not between them. Let's now move to a different region of the brain and see the pituitary gland. There in the centre, if we increase the magnification you can make out the pink stained cells and the darker purple nuclei. Under a thousand times magnification, here are the cells that control growth, blood pressure, sex, energy, pain, body temperature. These tiny cells, which most people never see, keep us functioning and alive. And so to the intestines, where even at low power, we can see the convoluted structure which allows nutriment to be absorbed. As the magnification increases, we can resolve the single cells themselves. In the mature small intestine, these crypts show more clearly. Specialised staining reveals the separate cells that secrete mucus to help move the digested food along. In the pelvis, we can observe bone. As the power of magnification is increased, the cells begin to emerge. They know how to align themselves to match the mechanical demands of the mass they have to bear. A crude section across the femoral head shows how the spongy bone is precisely laid down by those individual cells to match the demands of load bearing of the whole body. Computer graphics has now intervened. This beautiful CGI has been widely reproduced. But as you can see, its diffuse even structure misrepresents what the cells know. Were load bearing bones constructed like this, they would collapse under the weight of the body. Let's move across to observe the kidney and the smaller adrenal gland, above and to the right. The kidney is characterised by numerous groups of cells, forming the glomeruli, which screen the blood and purify it. In the rat embryo, it isn't yet fully formed. So let's turn to another section, this time of mature guinea pig kidney. Kidney structure is characterised by tightly packed nephrons, comprising tubules, and rounded glomeruli, discovered in 1666 by the Italian anatomist Marcello Malpighi. The glomeruli are where the blood plasma is forced out into the tubules from which all the required components are selectively reabsorbed. Once again we falsify reality when we say the kidney is a filter. A filter lets through small components but holds back larger ones. The cells of the glomeruli release almost all components and the tubules then selectively reabsorb those that are required for balanced metabolism. 
This is a process of immense complexity. The question is, how are those soluble components forced out of the blood and into the tubules? We can see this best if we don't look at a stained section, but at one in which the blood vessels have been injected with coloured carmine. Each of the glomeruli has a wide capillary that feeds it, and a far narrower one that carries blood away. That's where considerable hydrostatic pressure builds up, which forces the plasma into the tubules. Yet if we browse online, for example, all we see are CGI representations, and they almost all get it wrong. Time after time, the two blood vessels are the same diameter. The kidney couldn't function at all were that the case. Occasional examples show the two joining before they even enter the capsule. Once again, our popular teaching is profoundly wrong. Right across our teaching, the living cell, that crucial concept that creates humanity out of chemical chaos, is entirely ignored. If we look again online, it's hard to find anything remotely resembling the inimitable complexity of a living cell. All we see are these crude computer-generated cartoons. It is like using pictures of SpongeBob SquarePants to exemplify human anatomy. Scientific sites promulgate these garish, meaningless blobs. They look like the translucent balls of tapioca you find in bubble tea. They're like transparent jelly beans. These do not look like cells, and they're everywhere. The picture agencies license these images in their thousands. Living cells are not like these jelly beans. Here is a pulmonary endothelial cell captured by my colleague Dr Robert Marcus and Jafar Matavi of the School of Life Sciences at the University of Nottingham. It is bursting with activity, full of strange and complicated structures. It is not a jelly bean. Cells isolated in culture show the large ovoid nucleus with the darker nucleolus, where ribosomes are created. They translate the genetic code into RNA and protein products. Under the highest magnification attainable by a light microscope, ovoid organelles can be observed and, in a computer-enhanced image, elongated mitochondria can more clearly be seen, living their busy lives. These organelles liberate carefully mediated energy to support cell function. They release exothermic heat and regulate the metabolism of the cell. It is believed that mitochondria originally evolved from free-living bacteria that became incorporated into the eukaryotic cell, a revolutionary theory first proposed by a Russian botanist, Konstantin Merechowski, in 1905, and later promulgated by my late friend Lynn Margulis. Under high magnification phase contrast, we can even make out the endoplasmic reticulum, where lipids and proteins are synthesized and hormones can be produced, and fine microtubules within which intracellular transport takes place. A living cell is no diode. It is rich in meticulously managed activity, which we can barely discern and we cannot comprehend. As you can see in this epidermal cell from an onion, the movement of mitochondria and innumerable organelles is choreographed and considered. No cheap mathematical model is ever going to reveal the secrets of this traffic within the pseudopodia of a colonial amoeba. These particles have a purpose. The cells know where they're going and what they have to do. Boosting magnification to its limits, we can glimpse the baffling complexity of what goes on within an ordinary living cell. This is where life lies, and that's what bequeaths to us our existence. Under time lapse, watch how this mitochondrion adjusts its position. It's important that it does, though nobody knows why and the microtubules themselves bend and contort and alter their orientation. This is far beyond our comprehension. Within each living cell are thousands of microscopical components, many of which originally evolved from free-living microorganisms. Observing an isolated living cell in culture, under phase contrast, we can see how its extensions terminate in fine, ruffling extremities of unimaginable delicacy, exploring its surroundings, perhaps seeking to make contact with another single cell. This is a curious, inquisitive, outgoing little creature. Our proclivities as multicellular organisms are mere amplifications of what our single cells do every moment of every day. Using the highest magnification, Dr. Pickardeeps has revealed the ceaseless exploring 
and sensing of the surroundings that a single cell can perform. I'll bet your ears pricked up when I said there are no scientists studying living cells. They observe what they do, but they don't engage with a living cell. Here's an example from Uppsala in Sweden. She's taking a closer look at some of our most common immune cells. I find immune cells extremely fascinating because we can find them everywhere in the body. The, if we just understand their full potential or what they can do, I'm sure that we can use their potential in order to um, keep healthy. Of course they keep us healthy. They have done so for millions of years. Dr. Philipson is looking at them as though they're little diodes or transistors waiting to be harnessed by humans. When I first studied them 60 years ago, I saw them down the microscope as little living creatures, not just as fluorescent blobs. Their ability to function independently astonished me then. It continues to astonish me now. This time-lapse film was made about the same time by David Rogers at Vanderbilt University in Nashville, Tennessee. The sequence shows a leukocyte chasing paired staphylococci. This is what protects us from infection. Remember, this is an autonomous cell. It is not controlled by will or subconsciously. It isn't influenced by hormones or even by the brain. This cell knows for itself what it's doing. But the Swedish story goes on. If scientists succeed in uncovering all the secrets of the cell, it can be a tremendous benefit for all humanity. You see, even these people have no images of living cells. We need to look closely at the structure of the cell. Cell research is crucial to understanding how life works. Cells are like tiny machines that Here's another example from the Fuse School site. Every living organism is made up of cells. A human sperm cell has to be able to swim, while the cells that produce the peacock's tail must produce beautiful coloured pigments. Sometimes cells can exist on their own, such as a simple bacterium or a single-celled organism called an amoeba. But mostly, cells work together to form more complex multicellular organisms, such as animals, plants and insects. And here's a college course from Seeker Human. Once the ligand binds to a receptor, the chemical message gets interpreted and any number of biological reactions can happen. Cellular processes can start or speed up or slow down, often leading to complex chains of events that make up the important processes in our biology. Right off the bat, when we're looking at the different ways cells communicate, we care about the distance that the ligand has to travel. The cardiac gap junction and the natural killer cell examples both depend on the cells touching each other. But what if you wanted to talk to cells a little farther away? Next episode, we'll discover how our immune cells learn how to fight off invading pathogens and how they never forget. Worst of all is a ridiculous sequence from a BBC program designed to introduce us to the realities of the living cell. It's those crude jelly beans yet again. The story of the cell is the most powerful story in science. Everywhere you look at these crude computer generated jelly beans, there isn't a real cell in sight. These films are fakes. They are forgeries. If you did anything so perversely dishonest, in any other area of life, you'd end up in court. I find these films an embarrassment to science. Here's a real living cell. This ciliated protozoan ignores a diatom, sensing it isn't suitable, and then detects the perfect microbe meal. It darts in and wolfs it up. It is like watching a cat stalking prey on the lawn like that leukocyte we saw earlier, this is a cell with a mind of its own. And here's an alga, which has had the central cell of a community destroyed with a microneedle. This is a marine rhodophyte, Antithamnion. Not the kind of plant you'd expect to show intelligence. The neighbouring cells are signalling to each other and are moving in to repopulate the empty cell. 
the sequence is speeded up about 25 times and it clearly reveals the way that these cells are working out how to solve this unforeseeable problem. That is the hallmark of intelligence. If we look closely, we can see how the broken cell wall is being meticulously realigned and then new cell wall material is secreted to heal the wound and restore the integrity of the cell wall. Overnight, this damaged cell has been healed and restored to life. Similarly, here is a real ovum beginning to divide. It's from the toad Xenopus. You can see its organic, vital, voluptuous, pulsating movements as it undergoes those first divisions. And this is how the BBC presented an ovum, a dead, dried, electron microscope image that divides in two, then four. It's all a trick. A crude device to fool the viewer. Let's look again at that first so-called division. There's a characteristic feature on the crust of this dead cell. And it's here again, showing that the image of the cell has simply been duplicated and manipulated digitally. It never divided. When the cell appears to split again, we also see how the same random features are duplicated. This is all a fake designed to lull the viewer into believing they've seen something that never existed. There is no other area of science where such dishonesty would ever be tolerated. It happens only in a situation like this because so blind is the public to the realities of the living cell that nobody will ever notice and no one will ever complain. So here you can see uh, another red blood cell. Indeed, I'm deeply ashamed of some professionals who milk the situation for all it's worth. Or the uh, transformation of red blood cells giving rise to bacteria. No, that red cell is not making bacteria. They never have made bacteria and they never will. This is someone exploiting public ignorance of what living cells are like. So the first thing we must do is to understand how we need to comprehend what goes on in living cells before we can begin to master what goes on within our own bodies and our brains. The other thing we need to do is to get rid of this absurd notion that through the singularity so-called humans and machines are somehow equivalent and may combine. Of course we'll use technology to improve our performance. That's what you do when you cut a piece of paper with a knife. It's what you do when you walk up a ladder using a computer or any other form of digital technology is not in the least surprising to anybody. There's nothing magical about that. But people still do make the equivalents. Just have a look at this. In 2017, the Science Museum in London decided to build, well, they said they were rebuilding Eric from 1928. No, they weren't. Using modern technology and modern materials, they simply made a copy of what looked like Eric. It was not in any way a reconstruction. But Eric's theme was that he was being brought back to life. My name is Eric, and I'm thrilled to be alive. I want to thank each and every one of you here tonight from the bottom of my actuators. You, my wonderful Kickstarter backers, have helped me bring me back to life. And turn on American television, and you would have seen the Jimmy Fallon show, where Sophia, a robot, an autonomous robot, an interactive social robot, was introduced to him. Please welcome the founder and CEO of Hanson Robotics, David Hanson, and his robot, Sophia. Uh, David, you brought a friend with you here, and this is really kind of freaking me out. <laughs> yeah, this is uh, Sophia. Uh -huh. And Sophia is a social robot, mm. and she has artificial intelligence software that we've developed at Hanson Robotics which can process visual data. She can see people's faces. Uh, she can process uh, conversational data, emotional data. I mean, she's basically al alive. Is that what you're saying? Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, she is basically alive. <laughs> no, she's just a doll. A big one, but that's all. Just in case you think that Mr. Fallon was being duped, an entire kingdom has been taken in by it. Saudi Arabia, wait for this even made Sophia into a citizen and issued her with a passport. Oh, I would to thank very much the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. I am very honored and proud for this unique distinction. This is historical to be the first robot in the world to be recognized with a citizenship. Sophia. 
Thank you very much, Sophia. Now you may see the two thrusts of my argument, that indeed we do deny the reality of the living cell, and that we've allowed physics and malign mechanicals to overtake our thinking. We need a radical reappraisal of education and a revolution in our understanding. And we need that now.